May the peace of Christ be with you. If you're visiting with us for the first time, I hope that you'll sense the radical welcome of the love of God that we believe is extended for all people and for all creation. And we're delighted that those of you who aren't able to be here in person have been able to join via Zoom and Facebook. So welcome to you all. And for those of you who are in the sanctuary, I'd invite you to stand as you're able and join with me in the responsive call to worship. I invite you to join where it says all and is bolded. My people, I call to you. We look to the halls of power, to the weapons of the mighty, the tools of the merchants, but we do not hear your voice. My people, I call you and the secure, but we do not see your grace. My people, I call to you. We look to the poor, and you are present. We listen to the voiceless, and you speak to us. We open our broken hearts, and you enter. My people, I love you, and I am with you. We give you thanks. We give you our lives, and we worship you. Alleluia. Let's sing. Thank our God for sisters, brothers. Thank our God for sisters, brothers, one by grace in harmony, joining heart to heart with others, making strong community. With the cross of Christ our standard, let us sing as with one voice, Glory, glory, yours the promise, we who are the church rejoice. Praise to God for congregations, keeping faith with Christ as guide. Many tongues of many nations, a strong and service unified. Sweet the psalm and sweet the carol When our song is raised as one Glory, glory, yours the power As in heaven your will be done Holy, holy, warm forever Heal divisions that Churches, new endeavors, make our witness one again. One in Christ and in Christ's gospel, make us one we now implore. Glory, glory, yours the glory, then and now and ever. My friends, join me as I offer this opening prayer. Gracious God, we open our hearts to you that your spirit may flourish and bear fruit in us. May we be a garden of love, joy, and peace. And may we blossom with patience, faithfulness, and self-control. May our gentleness, kindness, and generosity bear fruit in the lives of those around us. Help us set aside all that hinders us from loving fully. By the grace of your beloved Son, Jesus the Christ, we pray and say together, Amen. As I mentioned from the outset, we are beginning a new worship series, and that is why the sanctuary looks as it does and Nancy McPherson is going to help us understand the significance of all of these peace cranes. Good morning. My name is Nancy McPherson. I'm a member of the worship committee and Kathy Toma and I usually design uh, the chancel visuals unless another committee has a special holiday that they are uh, in charge of. Um, originally because of Kathy's 
uh, personal connection, family connection to the crane, she was going to do this announcement, but she and her husband just got back from a trip and they had uh, a little touch of COVID on the way um, back to the US and they're doing great, um, but she just felt like she probably shouldn't be in church today. So I will hope to do her proud in this. So rest up Kathy and David, and I hope you're back to 100% soon. Um, one of the joys that Kathy and I have as members of the worship committee has been collaborating towards creating these visuals. Um, we have a discussion with our committee members, our worship committee members, and then we get a very large cup of coffee and sit and stare at the blank sanctuary chancel and get to work. Um, we always try to bring meaning to the message or the scripture of the week, either through a display of objects that directly relate to the sermon or set a mood of contemplation that will extend whatever theme is being discussed. We knew right away that today's sermon series that starts, um, it's called, Why Did Jesus, Moses, the Buddha, and Muhammad Cross the Road? Um, we knew that would be rich with a lot of imagery, but we really couldn't figure out where to start. We wanted to find visuals that would express the concept of a bold, brand new world of multi-faith action based on deep, true hospitality rather than hostility. We wanted visuals that suggested the possibility that Christians can have a strong identity that is benevolent, benevolent towards people of other faiths, accepting others not in spite of the religion they love, but with the religion they love. Could res love and respect for others as human beings lead us to a loving and respectful encounter with their religions as well? The author of the sermon series, Brian McLaren, asks, can't all religions walk as companions and allies along the spiritual path, together bringing shalom, which means peace, to a weary and war-torn world? And so for this sermon series, Kathy and I have chosen the peace crane as our visual symbol of hospitality and peace. The origami cranes that you see come on loan from the Los Altos United Methodist Church of California, where Kathy's sister Carol and brother-in-law Dirk are on staff. The three large linked ropes of cranes in the banner spots and on the both lecterns um, are a gift from Dirk's brother, who has an art school in Japan, and his Japanese students there folded a thousand cranes as a peace gift to send across the Pacific to Dirk's church in California. Um, we would like the opportunity for you and members of your family or friends to create a crane to add to the communion table in the weeks to come. So if you'd like to fold an origami crane, we have some kits out in the narthex for you um, to use. And um, they have instructions and, uh, a, link, and a link online, I, I believe, to see a video to help you learn. Um, some of you may know the story of the peace cranes in Japanese culture. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, we're happy we can introduce it to you in the following short video. As we use the cranes as our main visual over the next few weeks, let them be a reminder that reconciliation and hospitality can rise above hostility in and through all people and face of our world. As we listen and learn using this sermon series over the summer, let us all strive to be intentional about the hospitality of peace. Thank you and enjoy the video. The story of Sadako's 1000 paper cranes. In an effort to end World War II, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan on August 6, 1945. A young girl in Hiroshima, Japan named Sadako Sasaki was two years old when the atomic bomb was dropped. She survived the initial blast and grew up as a happy child who loved to run and play with her friends in elementary school. When Sadako was 11 years old, she started to feel weak and tired all of the time. In February of 1955, she was admitted to the Atomic Bomb Survivors Hospital in Hiroshima. Sadako had developed leukemia from her exposure to radiation from the atomic bomb. Students from a girls' school in Nagoya, Japan, sent origami cranes to the hospital to help the patients feel better. Some of these cranes were given to Sadako. 
Sadako's father sat beside her and said, When you fold 1,000 paper cranes, your wish will come true. Sadako began folding 1,000 paper cranes using the wrapping paper from gifts she received from friends. She would put the paper underneath her mattress to flatten out the wrinkles. When she ran out of paper, she also used the wrappers from medicine bottles. Some of the special red cranes she folded were made from the wrappers of a new medicine that was donated by an American company. Even though Sadako folded more than 1,000 paper cranes, she could not overcome her disease. She died of leukemia on October 22, 1955. A funeral was held a few days later, but the family was poor and did not have enough money for a tomb. After the funeral, many of Sadako's friends decided to help raise money for a memorial in Sadako's memory. Several days after the funeral, Sadako's friends heard that the conference of high school principals was being held in Hiroshima. Sadako's friends worked hard to print out a leaflet to distribute at the meeting. They hoped that the principals could help them raise money for Sadako's memorial. For two and a half years, Sadako's classmates worked hard on a fundraising campaign to raise money and support to build a memorial in honor of Sadako and all of the children who died from the atomic bombings. On May 5, 1958, the Children's Peace Monument was unveiled in the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. The statue of the young girl holding up the crane is now viewed around the world as a symbol of peace. Since 1958, many people from around the world, including thousands of student groups, have visited the Children's Peace Monument. Visitors have witnessed the annual release of doves to commemorate the anniversary of the atomic bombing. Many others have folded and sent strings of origami cranes to Hiroshima as a symbol of peace. In the early 2000s, Sadako Sasaki's older brother, Masahiro Sasaki, decided to donate five of Sadako's original origami cranes to five continents. He hoped that Sadako's kokoro, or spirit, could be shared with others. After the tragic events of September 11th, the Japan Society of New York invited Masahiro to New York City. He chose to place one of Sadako's most precious origami cranes at the Tribute World Trade Center Visitor Center at Ground Zero because of the devastating event that occurred there. The origami crane is a symbol of the Sasaki family's hopes for compassion and peace and, importantly, a lasting symbol of Sadako's life. Sadako folded origami cranes to keep her spirit and hopes alive. Today, Sadako's cranes have inspired a small ripple of hope for peace that has grown and spread around the world. If you enjoyed this read aloud, how about you subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss the next episode. And why don't you listen to another great read aloud where books for children come alive? Bye bye. See you next time. Good morning. Good morning. This morning's uh, scripture reading comes from the book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 51 through 62. In ancient Palestine, Samaritans and Jews did not get along. They were suspicious of one another and often rejected each other because of their religious and cultural differences. The gospel lesson today gives an example of rejection and fear from religious differences. The passage also shows Jesus's response to rejection. Rather than punishing or retaliating, he used the situation to teach the importance of showing kindness even to those who are hostile toward you. When it came close to the time for his ascension, he gathered up his courage and steeled himself for the journey to Jerusalem. He sent messengers, messengers on ahead 
they came to a Samaritan village to make arrangements for his hospitality. But when the Samaritans learned that his de destination was Jerusalem, they refused hospitality. When the disciples, James and John, learned of it, they said, Master, do you want us to call a bolt of lightning out down from the sky and incinerate them? Jesus turned on them. Of course not. And they traveled on to another village. On the road, someone asked if he could go along. I'll go with you wherever, he said. Jesus was curt. Are you ready to rough it? We're not staying in the best inns, you know. Jesus said to another, follow me. He said, certainly, but first, excuse me for a couple of days, please. I have to make arrangements for my father's funeral. Jesus refused. First things first, your business is life, not death. And life is urgent. Announce God's kingdom. Then another said, I'm ready to follow you, master. But first, <laughs> excuse me while I go get things straightened out at home. Jesus said, no procrastination, no backward looks. You can't put God's kingdom off till tomorrow. Seize the day. A contemporary reading that supports the theme of today is by James Allison, an English uh, priest and author. Give people a common enemy and you will give them a common identity. Deprive them of an enemy and you will deprive them of the crutch by which they know who they are. May God add a blessing to these readings and may they guide us in our journey to follow the way of Christ. Amen. Would you pray with me a moment? Holy One, that little Japanese girl showed us the power of peace. And sometimes the work of peace goes beyond a lifetime because it's worth doing, even when there are so many forces opposed to peace. So today, speak to us so that we can claim a kind of Christian identity that is strong and kind. Help us to embody the kind of Christian faith that Jesus would be delighted to see and join us in. Open us, help us. Encourage us and give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In the name of your Son, Jesus, who for us is the Christ, we say together, Amen. So, as Nancy mentioned earlier, we are entering into this series based on a book by Brian McLaren, and it's called Christ, A Christian Identity in the World of a Multi, in the Multi-Faith multi World. Now, I'm not going to say that six times in a row. You'll be glad for that. So you may be wondering uh, who this Brian McLaren is. Well, some of you may know um, who Brian McLaren is. He is... Um, He's a Christian thinker, he's an author, he's an activist. Um, we actually used one of his books, We Make the Way, We Make the Road by Walking during a Lenten season several years ago. Even though from his uh, Facebook page, it says that he's the author of over a dozen books, I actually went online and counted 22. So let's just say he is a prolific writer. And he, uh, he's the founder of this online community called Convergence. And Convergence is an effort to build a Christian identity that is authentic and real in a world where other religious faiths are legitimate and real. So I was drawn to this because the title why did Jesus, Moses, the Buddha, and Muhammad cross the road 
kind of piqued my interest, right? Haven't you heard, how many jokes have you heard that begin with that? So I'm thinking, well, this is going to be kind of funny. This is, and, and in the summer, after we've been doing some deep dives with Universal Christ and, and then all the kind of hard work we've done around Respond to Racism, I thought, let's, let's, have a, let's have something that might actually be fun and playful for the summer. Can I get a witness on that? And, and I, also, I also believe strongly in this Thomas Higginson quote, there's no defense against adverse fortune which is so effectual as a habitual sense of humor. Can we all agree on that, my friends? Brian McLaren also very pointedly recognizes that there's a difference between founders of faith and followers of faith. And I love this quote. Let's read it together. If Jesus, Moses, the Buddha, and Muhammad were to bump into each other along the road and go have a cup of tea or whatever, I think we all know they would treat one another far different and far better than a lot of their followers would. Amen to that. It's because the founders of faith have gotten to that place that Richard Rohr described as, as contemplative but also active oriented so that you can begin to have some integrity with your own faith tradition and yet also honor and recognize the integrity of other faith traditions. And it typically happens when one gives one's whole life to the contemplative search and to the struggles and challenges that it requires to be a human who's awake in the world in the midst of all of the hell that oftentimes is going on. Can I get a witness on that? So at the beginning of the book, Brian McLaren, who is an iconoclast, he sort of likes, he knows that uh, when he started doing this writing 10 or 15 years ago that the church was headed in a direction that was not going to be very good. It was in decline. And he was brave enough to ask, how is it that church may have to re-envision itself so that it will remain important in the lives of the people of the 21st century? So, so he makes this connection between a local church and a local pub by quoting William Blake. A good local pub has much in common with a church except that a pub is warmer and there's more conversation. Now, this was an 18th century poet, and at first I thought he was talking about the warmth of the people culture, but then I realized he may have actually been talking about it's warmer in the pub with more people in a confined space than it is in a cathedral with no heat. I think both may be right. And I'll show my age here. We all know, well, we may not all know the show. Many of us know the show of Cheers, and here's Cliffy and Norm, and we all know that Norm would come into the bar and everybody would say, and they're always glad you came. Now, I actually think that this church is a little like Cheers in that when we don't see someone, we miss them. And when we do see them, we're glad that we're seen. Can I get a witness on that? Is, that? is that kind of the way we work? And I will say that when I read the introduction to his book several months ago, uh, it inspired me to offer to the growth team what I called pint with a pastor. And so this past Thursday, um, there were folks who gathered by the purple umbrellas, and uh, there, were, there was beer and non-beer as I put on two, uh, two of the coolers. So that's going to happen if you missed it and you want to have another chance at it. Thursday, the 21st of July, same time, same place, and uh, we'll sustain that energy, camaraderie, and friendship. But let me dig into a little bit what Brian McLaren's getting at with this, what he calls conflicted religious identity syndrome, which he uses C-R-I-S as a shorthand, which is almost crisis, but close. 
Two typical Christian identities, Brian, and, he, and he's oversimplifying, but he, he draws out two typical Christian identities at work in the world today. One is a strong Christian identity that responds negatively to other religions. The stronger the Christian commitment, the stronger the aversion to other religions. And folks might think, we'll be friendly and we'll love folks in spite of their religious identity, hoping that eventually they'll see the light and shelter under the tent of who we are. Now, before we start pointing fingers at, at other churches, let's also acknowledge, at least I can acknowledge, that I am oftentimes hoping when I'm in conversation with people that they might want to come check out our church. So I also would like folks to come under our tent because I think it's a good tent. But it's not the only tent. So here's the other main kind of uh, uh, tradition, the accommodating Christian identity. And, and this, this probably relates to most of us. Positive responses to other religions, the, the tendency to minimize differences and maximize commonalities. We love them in spite of our own religious identity, and we make it matter less that they're Muslim or Hindu by making it matter less that we're Christian. Am I the only one here who has had that tendency in their Christian faith? If you, if you water it down a little bit, it might not be quite so offensive. And all of a sudden you're wondering, well, what's up with that? So Brian is saying, maybe there's a third way. Maybe there's a third identity. A Christian identity that is strong and kind. Strong meaning vigorous, vital, durable, attractive, defining, worth having, I would add. Not the kind of kindness that's just kind of tolerant or politically correct or even emphasizes coexistence. No, kind is benevolent, hospitable, interested, and accepting. The stronger our Christian identity, the more goodwill we will feel and show toward those faiths seeking to understand and appreciate their religious faith from their point of view. And finally, Christian identity moves us toward people of other faith traditions, not in spite of their non-Christian identity, and not in spite of our own Christian identity, but because of our identity as followers of God in the way of Jesus Christ. Does that resonate with you, my friends? Sometimes these days, over the last 72 hours, I have been keenly aware that Brian McLaren's emphasis was on a strong and kind faith as it relates to multiple faith traditions. This week, the struggle has focused on the way to have a Christian faith that's strong and kind within our Christian family. And the elephant in the room is, of course, the Supreme Court decision about Roe v. Wade. And interestingly enough, there were many people who were angered and frustrated and disappointed and felt betrayed, and there were others who celebrated. And most of them were all in the Christian family. And this picture happens to capture those who are both against what happened and those who were for what happened. And you can see from that picture the range of emotional response. And what I struggle with the most this week is the smugness of those who were happy with the decision. And yet, were I in their camp for the past 50 years, if they had been praying for this kind of decision, I can understand, even though I do not agree, with their emotional reaction. Because it all comes down to life and when we define it and whose life matters. 
You cannot have this conversation without being clear about that. And unfortunately, from my perspective as a theologian, I would much rather honor the life of the woman who is already alive and her ability to choose what is correct for her. Being pro-choice does not mean being pro-abortion. I have never, ever, ever met a woman who was like, oh, wait, I cannot wait to have an abortion. This can't, can't wait. It's, it's gut-wrenching if you've ever been with someone who's trying to make that decision. It isn't entered into lightly. So my making it law, that's going to make things better? Yes, I think all life is important. But our Jewish ancestors believed that ruah, spirit, breath, when that entered a person, that's what defined them as being human. Now, I don't want to, uh, well, I confess, I have been bashing people who are in the opposition to me internally. I haven't said it out loud, but can I get a witness on how easy it is in either direction, right? And I keep thinking about what Brian McLaren says, how do we have a Christian faith that is strong and kind? If we bash people we're in disagreement with, there's never going to be any hope of peace because we'll just sustain it, which is different, which is different from speaking our truth with a kind of power that expresses how and where we value life. And it's complex, my friends, let's face it, We've been arguing about it for 50 years, and now it'll be another 50 years, perhaps. But we, as a Christian community, believe that it's important to support people who are alive and trying to make decisions for their own well-being. And by the way, if you've ever known a woman who's been raped, think about how this would feel to them or someone who has experienced incest. I will be forced to carry this child? How is that not damaging to a life that's already alive? Okay, I wasn't going to preach that sermon, but it came out anyway. <laughs> I don't want to be that kind of Christian. How many of us have said that, right? I mean, that's the, the noun Christian alone either says too much or not enough. Can I get a witness on that? So here are the list of adjectives, kind of both ends. Progressive, fundamentalist, evangelical, Anglican, Southern Baptist, Quaker, Catholic, Protestant, incarnational, Bible-believing, social justice, contemplative, charismatic, pro-choice, pro-life, LBGTQI affirming, LBGTQI condemning. As Brian says, why is it that we have to have so many adjectives? because there are extremists in every religion. This is the Texas Christian pastor who actually suggested that if you were gay, you should be shot. And he calls himself Christian. Has he asked Jesus about that? These are ultra-national Jews walking through East Jerusalem because they believe that they deserve to have all of the Holy Land. They are the extreme. There are lots of Jews who believe that Palestine should be honored and that there should be a place and we should, they should be a peaceful resolution, but there are extremists. In the Muslim world, there are extremists. With every major religious faith, there are extremists. And here's the point that Brian McLaren makes, I think, very, very well. The root cause of conflicted religious identity syndrome. What does that picture tell you? What's it say to you? 
And what else? Hostility. Whether we realize it or not, Brian McLaren says, most of us who suffer from crisis are trying to distance ourselves from religious hostility. The attitude of exclusion, not embrace. Repugnance, not respect. Conflict, not conviviality. Are we getting to the heart of it now, sisters and brothers? And why do we stay with it? Because there's still something that shines from the heart of our religious faith, our Christian faith. There's a saving drive. I don't know about you, but amidst everything that's happening, there's still a drive towards peace and understanding and self-control, dignity, character, duty, integrity, and even beauty. Are you sensing that drive even now? I hope so. Because there are plenty of shadowy struggles with a hostile drive. It's dangerous, resilient, and deeply ingrained. So the $64,000 question is, how do we disassociate from hostility without abandoning our identity? And how do we faithfully affirm the uniqueness and universe, universality of Christ without turning that belief into an insult or a weapon, with no matter who we are in dialogue with? Why do we hang in there with Christianity? Brian McLaren is very transparent about this. He says, if we want to affiliate with any group of human beings, sooner or later, we will be associated with bigotry, intolerance, stupidity, and pride. Ever been with a group of people and not seen some of that show up? I, I'm sure you have, because it's in all of us. Right? That's the challenge. And you know what? He says there's no escaping the human condition, which is why I remain faithful to the Christian, the Jesus way, because Jesus recognized that we are human and said, I know it. Keep going. I love you. A new religion, Brian says, well, some people are deciding to go kind of shopping for a dif different kind of religion. Try on another one. Maybe that'll work. He says, a new religion may be worse than an old religion because at least older religions have learned from, its, from their failures. At least that's the hope. Christianity has failed in many ways, as have other religions. And this is the key. A solidarity with other failed religions can expand the gracious space of solidarity which may be what Jesus meant by the kingdom of God. Now, my friends, this is so countercultural because we're not usually looking for solidarity with failure. We are looking for solidarity with winners. Who wants to be part of a loser? You'll remember the Christian story is that Jesus was the consummate loser on the cross, if you don't remember the whole story. And the whole story has not yet been told. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, the arc of justice and peace bends long, but it goes way out. So there are some steps that Brian McLaren suggests. First and foremost is to revisit and understand our history, both American history and Christian history, to get at why this hostility in our country exists and to re-envision three foundational aspects of our Christian faith. The doctrine, and we are not a heavy doctrine church, but there are some things about us that are doctrine-oriented. And the liturgical challenge, that is how it is that we live our liturgical season. And finally, the missional challenge, or that is, what is our mission? There are ways in which, in each of these three pillars, we can make some progress towards a strong Christian identity that is also kind. So here are some points to ponder, my friends, if I haven't given you enough already. Have you experienced conflicted religious identity syndrome? I'll probably ask you, how have you this past week? Did you find a strong Christian identity that is also attractive and worth growing into? Does that appeal to you? 
And are you living that way already? And where are your biggest challenge or challenges? How might Bethel live into this kind of Christian identity? And finally, do you agree with Brian McLaren that by pushing into the shadow side of our faith, that is, the way that we failed, a stronger, kinder faith will emerge? If you've done any therapy or counseling or depth work, you know that we all have a shadow side. It's the stuff that's cruddy about us that we can't see because it's unconscious and in the shadows. And that's why religion can be so dangerous is because it's not acknowledging its own shadow. So as we move in this direction of a strong and kind faith, I also want us to be confessional that we are still human and Christians work in progress. And we are not superior to anybody. But we do know that we are loved beyond our wildest imaginations, and so is everyone else. My friends, let's stick together during this difficult time. We need to support one another. We need to challenge one another. We need to listen to one another. We need to be kind, and we need to be strong. May God add a blessing to the words I've shared, to the thoughts they've evoked, and even perhaps the path that we may choose moving forward. And the people were heard to say, Amen. Let's sing. Uh, this is a new one this week, so I'll encourage you to get your book out uh, if you've got any music reading skills. Um, and open it up to number 56. In this, oh, thank you. In the soft back hymnal, yeah, the sing prayer praise hymnal. You are, you are the essence of creation. You are stronger than the walls we build to keep us apart. You are. You are beyond our words to hold you. You are beyond our understanding, yet known within our hearts. And then we go to verse 1. God of Moses, hear our stuttered praise. Use our strength and weakness to free all enslaved. To the refrain. You are, you are the essence of creation. You are stronger than the walls we built to keep us apart. You are, you are beyond our words to hold you. You are beyond our understanding, yet known within our hearts. We go to verse 2. God of Isaac and of Ishmael, heal our wounds so deep in time that shalom we might find. You are, you are the essence of creation. You are stronger than the walls we built to keep us apart. You are, you are beyond our words to hold you. You are beyond our understanding, yet known within our hearts. God of Dinah, a story seldom heard. Hear the pain we hold this day. Embrace us with your word. You are, you are the essence of creation. You are stronger than the walls we built to keep us apart. You are, you are beyond our words to hold you. You are beyond our understanding, yet known within our hearts. Verse 4. 
God of birthing and of eagle wing. Hold us through your fear and doubt. Breathe through the song we sing. You are, you are the essence of creation. You are stronger than the walls we built to keep us apart. You are, you are beyond our words to hold you. You are beyond our understanding, yet known within our hearts. Last verse here. God of history revealed an ancient word. Surround us with your voice this day. Let your love be heard. You are, you are the essence of creation. You are stronger than the walls we built to keep us apart. You are, you are beyond our words to hold you. You are beyond our understanding, yet known within our hearts. You are, you are, you are, you are, you are, you Nice job learning that one. That was, we picked that one up pretty good in one, one reading. Good job. Have a seat. There's nothing like repetition, and looking at those notes is a lot harder than listening to Owen sing, which is pretty easy, isn't it, friends? Holy One, we pray for patience and for wisdom, for understanding and for deep listening. As difficult as that is, may we practice the way of Jesus. Jesus, of course, was the consummate teacher, prophet, and for us, the sign of you enfleshed in human form. And his disciples oftentimes didn't understand what he was saying and were confused by his radical messages of love and understanding for breaking down rules that seem to confine people rather than liberate them. So one day, Scripture tells us that they came and asked their rabbi and said, Rabbi, how should we pray? And he offered this, our ancient prayer. Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, my friends, we've come to the time in our worship where we can lift up the opportunity to give, to support the church with your time, your talent, and your treasure. You can leave a financial gift in the offering plate on your way out. There are offering plates at each door. You can also mail in a check if you'd like. On our website, there's an electronic giving option, which is very user-friendly, where you can use the phone number that you see there to text an amount and we are grateful for the generosity of this people to continue our ministry. Now I would invite you to stand and gather together with the singing of the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise 
praise God for all that love has done. Creator Christ and Spirit One. Amen. And now join me in the responsive prayer of dedication in unison. Gracious God, we thank you for your grace. You have made us one in Christ, gathered us as your children, and fed us with your word. Send us into the world as one to break down the barriers that divide us, to reach out to those who are outcast, and to proclaim in word and deed the miracle of your grace for all people. Send us in the name of Christ, and the power of your Holy Spirit to do your will for your glory. Amen. Let's sing again. Uh, it's in the hardback hymnal, number 391, In the Midst of New Dimensions. of new dimensions in the face of changing ways who will lead the pilgrim peoples wandering in their separate ways god of rainbow fiery the journey now and ever now and ever now and ever more through the flood of starving people warring factions and despair who will lift the olive branches who will light the flame of God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar. You're the people, ours the journey, now and ever, now and ever, now and ever more. As we stand, a world divided by our own self-seeking schemes. Grant that we, your global village, might envision wider dreams. God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar, your people, ours the journey, now and ever, now and ever, now and ever more. We are man and we are woman, all persuasions, young and old, each a gift in your creation. A love song to be sung. God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar. We, your people, ours the journey, now and ever, now and ever, now and ever more. The threats of thy predictions cause us to withdraw in pain. May your blazing Phoenix spirit resurrect the church again. God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the 
of sorrow. We are people as the journey now and ever, now and ever, now and ever more. My friends, we are never alone. And it is by the power of God's Holy Spirit revealed to us by Jesus the Christ and sustained by our work together for loving kindness. So go in peace to serve and to worship and to be love in the world for God's sake and in Jesus' name. And together we say, Amen. And now I think it's time for Chad. <laughs>